what are qualia and what are they doing in my mind? Let's consider. Hello, philosophers. I'm Chico. Welcome to The Philosopher Show, where we consider the greatest questions of human history. So far, all I've really looked at in this playlist is materialistic philosophies of mind, right? Philosophies or theories that have said that the mind is nothing but either something physical or the mind doesn't exist and only physical things exist or really material things, I should say, um, because we'll see a, an emergentism um, that John Searle wants to say that non-material things can also be physical. But in any case, um, all we've looked at is materialistic views. Um, qualia arguments are meant to sh disprove that, to show that the mind exists and must be immaterial, whether it exists as a group of properties or it exists as a separate entity or, or whatever it is. And I think it's important to note before we even get started, most people that use qualia arguments today are using it because they think it proves dualism is true. Right, they think, uh, and dualism. When we're talking about mind-body dualism, I'll make an. I'm going to make another video that's on what dualism is. But um, as sort of a, a quick synopsis, dualism is the idea that the body, including the brain, are material as a material entity. The mind is a separate and distinct immaterial entity. And it uses the body, but is not identical to the body. So uh, there's dualism. And people have used this argument against materialistic views of the mind, thinking that it proves dualism because dualism, uh, you know, for the past, I don't know, 30 years or so of philosophy of mind, the two options in town have been a materialistic view and a dualistic view. There are actually a lot more views of mind that are possible. Uh, emergentist, hylomorphist, idealist, right? There, there are all these different views that are possible. And yet people, when they look at these qualia arguments, think that you're going to be a dualist. So just a heads up, that's not exactly what this, do, this does. What this does is just to disprove uh, materialist views of mind. So what we could say is that it argues for an immaterialist view of mind, the idea that the mind must be not material, not to say that it's it's something separate from the brain, but maybe it's a property of the brain, maybe it's dependent on the brain, maybe it's a principle along with the brain, and maybe it is a separate entity like the dualists say. And heads up, if you're taking a philosophy of mind class, your professor's probably going to think that, or is going to present it like the only two options here are materialism or dualism, maybe with panpsychism as like an oddball third one in there. Um, but yeah, most philosophy professors uh, that, that teach these courses don't really go through all the possibilities, but we will. So you are in luck. But what are qualia arguments? What is a qualia in the first place? We'll start off just by looking at the three big arguments for qualia. Two, the first two being kind of like different versions of the same. And then we'll talk, look at the third one. And then I'll give you the gist of qualia arguments. And, and we'll go from there. In Thomas Nagel's famous essay, What is it like to be a bat? He, he says something like this. Um, it's been a long time since I've read it, so um, I don't. I think it's what it's like to be a bat, or what is it like to be a bat? I can't remember. But he says um, the bats experience the world through echolocation, right? They experience the world by making sounds. The sounds vibrate back to them, and then they get uh, a mental map of what's in, what's around them. Okay, um, and typically when we think about that uh, I picture like sonar, right? I picture like a submarine and boo -doo -doo -doo, boo -doo -doo -doo, you know, and then those things bounce back and you can see, you know, um, but that's a visual in uh, a visual interpretation of echolocation, right? I'm picturing visually things going out and coming back and then a screen displaying uh, a map of what's out there. That's not what echolocation is. Right? Echolocation is a different kind of experience. 
It's not like a visual experience. So now imagine you become a bat expert and you know everything about the bat brain. You have dissected it to you know the last neuron. You know exactly what happens in the brain when a bat um, experiences a rock in front of it through its echolocation. Um, do you know what it's like to be a bat? Do you know, from, from learning all that about the brain of the bat, do you know what it's like to experience echolocation? Seems like you don't. Well, here's a similar one from Frank Jackson, which is interesting because Frank Jackson, who put, who put forth this argument, like took it back and doesn't believe it anymore. But um, I don't know. Like, I, I, I think he's wrong to dig it back. We'll see. Um, consider a scientist named Mary. Now, Mary was born and raised in a black and white room, right? Could not see any colors. Everything somehow was just colorless in this room. And Mary became a brain expert and specifically became an expert on what the brain does when it sees color. How does she do this? I don't know. Let's say that um, she is she can see out like a window, but everything is black and white through that window. And then she can, you know, put her hands in those gloves and then she can operate on stuff. So she, she's become an expert on the human brain. Uh, makes more sense. She, she learned it off the internet. Let's say that, um, the internet, but it's a black and white computer. So she knows absolutely everything that happens in a human brain when a human, when a human perceives red, the color red. And then one day, magically the door opens, she walks outside and she sees red for the first time. Has she learned something new? Seems like she has, right? Even though she knew everything about the brain when uh, somebody sees red, now she's actually experienced red. That means it seems like that's something additional. And finally, the third argument are zombie arguments. And zombie arguments go something like this. Imagine a possible world that is physically identical to our world, except for people have no experiences at all, right? They're doing everything that they're doing right now. Like I'm doing everything I'm doing, talking to you on this video and um, looking at a camera cap right now and things like that. I'm doing it. I'm moving around and everything, but I'm not actually experiencing everything, anything. I'm more like a robot that is just going through these motions and, um, you know, getting stimuli, but is not actually ex feeling anything when, when the stimuli um, uh, touch me any more than a robot feels something, right? A robot just is, is just turning bits over, right? Um, a sensor is triggered and then it's, it's all mechanical. So uh, there's a possible world, zombie world, where everything Everybody is physically identical except for doesn't have experiences. Doesn't that show that there's a difference between that possible world and this possible world? Doesn't that show that there is some additional thing that we have that is not there in the possible world, the zombie world? So all these arguments are meant to show that there is some additional thing that we could call qualia. And by the way, I'm going to get this definition from this book, Mind, Matter, and Nature, by James Madden, I believe, James D. Madden, which is an excellent book. I also like William Jaworski's Philosophy of Mind. I've been using that one heavily, too, for this playlist. Um, but um, the, the definition I, I'm going to get from him, from James Madden, qualia are qualitative, subjective aspects of sensation. Um, they're the what it's like to of of whatever you're doing you know like so you jump in a hot bath you jump out because it's too hot that's behavior but the actual feeling of pain would be the qualia that would be the experience that you have so in the bat example for example uh thomas nagel's bat um everything was identified in the bat brain but what was not identified there was the qualia of echolocation, the actual experience that the bat was happening, having. And we couldn't, we can't even conceive of what that, what that would be like, right? Duckbill platypus uh, can experience uh, electric impulses, right? It, it can, 
it, somehow, right? It doesn't see them, but it, it senses them and it can act on that. What is that like? We can't even perceive it. We can't even conceive of it. In the Mary example, the scientist, um, Mary knew everything. Uh, Mary identified everything that happens in the brain when the color red is seen. And yet what was not identified was the qualia of experiencing color, right? You can look in the brain anywhere you want to, and you're not going to see that perception somewhere, you know? Um, I, I look at a bus, and you can look inside of my brain, and you're not going to find a little bus. So even though you can tell what's happening in my brain, um, what's not there is the, quali the qualitative experience, subjective qualitative experience. So uh, qualia arguments go something like this. Qualia are immaterial mental properties that exist. And there are two supports here. The first one being knowledge arguments, which are like the, the what it's like to be a bat and Mary, the colorblind Mary or the one who was raised in colorless world. Uh, qualia, like the experience of echolocation or color, are not located in the brain. You can look in the brain at all you want to, but you're not going to find those things. Two, in a different possible world, a physical brain could exist without qualia. So therefore, there must be something different there, something additional that we have called qualia. Therefore, the mind is an existent immaterial entity. So those are qualia arguments. So those are qualia arguments. And um, I have to say, I think that they are pretty impressive. Right, the fact that you have an experience, and there's nowhere in in the physical brain that can account for that. Right? Maybe it can account for the arising of the experience. You know, maybe the experience emerges from the neurons moving around or something like that. But nowhere in that brain is that experience. So how can you argue against that? Well, um, the first objection I can think of is a reducibility objection. So when we look at water, we experience, you know, clearness and wetness and all those kinds of things, but we don't experience H2O and yet nothing exists, exists except the H2O, right? Um, so maybe the same thing is here, like we experience equalia, but the only thing that really exists there is the brain and the qualia don't really exist. But if you think about the 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 analogy doesn't really hold here. Like water, sure, we have this experience of water, but water is made up of H2O, right? It's not like qualia are made up of neurons. It's not like when you look at, at a, a qualia, then you start breaking it down. You're like, oh, look, there's that neuron and there's that neuron, right? Um, so you couldn't say that qualia are reducible. Maybe they're dependent upon but they're not reducible to brain uh, figure configurations. A further problem is, you know, when we look at water and we experience it the way that we experience it, you could say, oh, well, that's just an illusion, right? Like, that's just the way we see it, but that's not the way it really is. The way it really is is just these hydrogen oxygen molecules. But if you want to say the qualia are just an illusion, well, what's an illusion? An illusion is a subjective qualitative experience. So by saying that qualia are an illusion, you're just saying that qualia are qualia, right? You're just proving that qualia exists. So I don't think that's going to be a good argument. A second objection that we could hold is that descriptions of the brain like Mary and uh, our bad expert might have uh, and descriptions of the mind like, uh, or, or I should say qualia, you know, um, are just two conceptually distinct descriptions of the same thing. But that doesn't prove non-identity. doesn't prove that the two things aren't identical. So, for example, um, this is uh, from philosopher Andrew Melnick. Um, imagine I get uh, a case of amnesia and I forget my own name. I forget who I am and everything. I wake up the next morning and I read a newspaper. The newspaper says... Uh, Chico is about to get executed for crimes against humanity. And I say, oh, wow, sucks for that guy, right? Now, here I have a description, Chico being a guy who's going to be executed. 
And here I have a personal experience of myself, right? And those are two different things. And I, at first, don't know that the two are identical. Even though it's counterintuitive, the two are identical. So maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe it's, it's just that the description of the brain that we have from Mary is epistemologically different than the uh, qualitative experience, but it's still describing the same thing. The problem with this objection, I believe, is that the point is not an epistemological one. It's an ontological one, right? The point isn't that Mary just learned some new way of thinking about the same thing. The point is that there's something there that isn't the material brain. You know, maybe it's dependent upon the brain, maybe it's not, but it's not the material brain. Or again, uh, the point about echolocation isn't that there's a way of conceiving of the bat brain that we just can't do, we can't conceive of. Uh, The point is that the bat brain there does not, there is no qualia, but there must be qualia, right? There's the qualia doesn't exist in the brain and yet qualia exist. So again, it's, it's not a matter of, uh, using the two descriptions to prove two different things, it's a matter of pointing out that there are two different things, right? Pointing out that, hey, you have a brain here, but then there's this other thing, right? Like this qualitative thing that doesn't, it's not in that brain. A third objection comes from Daniel Dennett, which is that qualia are confusing. They're bizarre. They're weird. Um, So he has this example where these two guys uh, are taste testers and they both taste test coffee and a specific brand and i can't remember what the brand is um but uh they love it and uh thoroughly enjoy it six years later they try it again and they hate it and now they both have a disagreement one person says you know what i think they changed the uh they changed the the taste of the coffee um and the other person says no sir it's we who have changed. Our tastes have changed. Um, how do you how do you go about reconciling that? How do you actually um, solve that problem? Do you go back in time and take their qualia and compare it to their present qualia and see are their qualia the same or not? No. What you could do though is you could well you could have taken uh, six years ago. Uh, a sample of the coffee mixture and uh, done a scientific study of their taste buds and then six years later do a new one of both and then compare the two. So Dennett says, you know, like the objective stuff, that's the stuff that we can actually use. The qualia, what do, you know, those are things that are just bizarre. Um, the huge problem with this objection is it doesn't really prove anything. What, all it does is to show you that um, qualia are weird. That doesn't mean they don't exist. It doesn't even try to argue that they don't exist, right? It just argues that they're weird. Sick. Lots of stuff are weird, right? <laughs> like That doesn't prove anything. Uh, you could further this objection with, a uh, we'll, we'll say this is a, a fourth objection, I believe. Are we on five or four? Four. Um, and say, okay, so qualia are weird. And what do they, what do they prove? What do they show us about behavior? You know, do they explain why people do certain things? Why people um, say that they like something and then later on say they dislike it or something like that? No, the the taste buds and the uh, uh, physical constitution of of the coffee that would show you um, a difference, but the qualia don't. They don't add anything to that story. Therefore, why posit that they exist? Um, And this, I think, shows a huge misunderstanding with uh, philosophers that qualia are not posited, right? It's not like I'm saying, huh, I'm going to posit the fact that I'm having an experience of a, a blue wall right now, right? No, Qualia are datum, right? The data, excuse me. They're they're things that are to be explained, not things that we posit in order to explain something else. So 
this objection totally misses the point, right? The point is that that we have experiences and now we want to explain like, well, where do these things come from? And this is similar to a final objection that I'll, I'll consider, which I found on Twitter. I can't remember who the philosopher was, but um, the objection was, and I, by the way, I'm not on Twitter anymore. I, I just couldn't handle it anymore. Um, but the objection was, um, why are we still talking about qualia when nobody can even tell me what qualia really are? In other words, we can't define what a qual a quale is. A quale is the singular term of uh, qualia. It's Latin. I don't know why people decide that they need Latin, but um, if you can't define a quale, then this argument goes, then they are discounted from things that we could say exist, which is a horrific argument. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of things that you can't define that clearly exist. Existence itself, right? I say something like, I exist. Can you define existence perfectly to a place where like, it's, it's uh, distinguishable from all other things? No, because every time you do, you're going to be like, like, compare me to things that don't exist. What doesn't exist? Uh, well, unicorns. Well, unicorns, at least they exist in your mind, right? Like, compare me to something that doesn't even exist in your mind, something that is nothing. Well, nothing doesn't exist, right? Nothing is not a thing. So I can't compare it with something. So to try to define existence really is impossible with what you can do is just point to things that exist and say, hey, that thing right there, that thing is doing it, right? Or you can point to things that exist outside of the mind and say, hey, look, that thing right there, it's existing in a way that unicorns are not existing. Um, but unicorns exist like mentally and so does that thing. Just that thing exists outside the mental. Um, so... Uh, yeah, just because you can't define a thing doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There are plenty of things that we can't define like that. This is something that I would say probably you would call mental ostensive definition, something that you just point to and say, yeah, that thing, that's what I'm talking about. So qualia, I might not be able to define what they are, but I can say, hey, you're looking at me right now, right? You're experiencing a blue shirt and a very attractive Latino man, right? That's what I'm talking about. Those are qualia. So, yeah, I, um, this is a horrific objection. Now, a quick reminder, these, argue, these qualia arguments prove immaterialism about the mind. They don't show that the mind is independent of the brain. They don't show the mind is dependent on the brain. They don't show whether the mind is just a property of the brain or if it's a, a separate substance or, or anything like that, right? All that they show is that the, the mind exists and is not a material object, which is actually a pretty big deal, right? That's pretty significant. Just think about, because think about it, like you have this experience and you know it's not a physical thing in your brain, right? Maybe it, the brain gives rise to this experience, but the experience itself is not physical. Again, if I look at a book, right? I'm having experience of a book. It's not like there's a miniature book in my brain, right? Um, so that's pretty bizarre, right? You can know that you are at least partially not a physical thing. That's pretty significant, or I should say not a material thing. Um, we'll talk about emergentism soon. Um, but anyway, before I go, I want to say that qualia arguments are typically derided in philosophy classes. So your your philosophy professor will likely just, will give one of the objections that I've given. And if you respond in one of the ways that I've responded and they can't answer it, they are just going to like, they're, they're just, this is stupid. You know, um, I don't know. I'm pretty convinced about these quality arguments. I, I, they seal the deal for me. So for me, I, I would love to engage any questions you have. Um, if, if you present an objection and, um, I didn't talk about it at all, please feel free to throw it out there in the comments. And I'd love to engage with anything like that. Um, but yeah, I think it's fascinating. Like you can know that you are not physical in some way. You're not material in some way. 
Anyway, that's it for this video. Uh, I'll do some more Philosophy of Mind videos hopefully pretty soon, and I'll see you in one of those. Adios. Bye.